from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2021 virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Hello and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon 21, CloudNativeCon 21 virtual. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. We're here with a great segment with an entrepreneur and also the creator and maintainer of FluentBit, Eduardo Silva who's now the founder of Calypti, who is a startup going to commercialize and have an enterprise grade Fluent D and Fluent Bit. Eduardo, great to have you on. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having me here. So I'm very happy to share the news about the Pro year and talk whatever you want about them. Exciting trends, exciting trends happening with CNCF, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con. Cloud Native, a lot of data, a lot of management, a lot of logging, a lot of observability, a lot of end user um, contributions and enterprise adoption. So let's get into it first by giving us a quick update on Fluent D. Anything upcoming to highlight? Yeah, well, uh, Fluent is actually turning 10 years old uh, right now. So it's the more mature project uh, that we have for, for log management and log processing in the market. And we are really happy to see that despite a project that was started 10 years ago, its adoption, it continue, continues growing the ecosystem from a plugin perspective and companies adopting the technology that, that is really great. So it's very overwhelming and actually really happy to to take this project and continue working with companies, individuals, and and right now, what is the position where we are now with FluentD? So part of the roadmap is like a, one of the things that people is facing, not because of the tool, because people has every time they has more data, more microservices, the, the system are scaling up. It's like about performance, right? And performance is critical. Uh, if you are slowing down the uh, data processing, actually you are not getting the data at the right time when you need it. Right? Nowadays, people need real-time queries, real-time analysis. So from a fluidity perspective, we are going to focus a lot on everything that is about performance. I would say for this year and maybe the other one, I would say that we won't see many new features around FluentD itself as, as a project. So we'll be mostly about backfixing and performance improvements. Yeah, I definitely want to dig in with you on the data and logging challenges around Kubernetes, especially with end-to-end -end workflows and you know, there's the different environments that it sits in the middle of. But first, before we get there, just take a minute to explain for the folks um, not that savvy with FluentBit, what is FluentBit? Real quick, explain what it is. Okay, so I will start with a, with a quick story about this. So when we started FluentD, we envisioned that at some point, uh, I'm talking about six years ago, right? All this IoT train or embedded or edge will be available. And for that use, it will be good, but too heavy, right? If you have a constrained environment or you want to process data in a more faster way without all the capabilities at that time, we, we say that Fluid might not be suitable for that. So the thing is, okay, Fluid was not longer like a, a single software piece, right? We wanted to say Fluentd is an ecosystem, right? And as part of the ecosystem, we have SDK where people can connect applications to Fluentd, but also we say we need like a Fluentd, but that could be lightweight and faster. Fluentd is written in Ruby, right? And the critical parts in C, but since it's written in Ruby, of course, there's some uh, pros and cons on how do you process the data and how much you can scale, right? So we say, if you're going to dig into embedded or small constrained environments, let's write a similar solution, but in C language. So we can optimize on memory, we can optimize on IO, and all these kind of um, needs will be, will, will be fixed, right? And we started this project called Fluent Bed. And FluidBit is like a, nowadays, it's like a lightweight version of FluentD. It is started for embedded Linux, but after a few years, people from the cloud space, I'm talking about containers, Kubernetes, they started to ask for more features for FluentBit because they wanted, they had FluentD, but also they wanted to have FluentBit on it because of it was lightweight. And nowadays we can see that what well, FluentD is established in the market and FluentBit, we're getting around 2 million uh, Docker Hub downloads every single day. So nowadays the traction of the project is, is incredible and it's mostly used to, um, on to collect logs from the files, from systemd, and from most of Kubernetes environment is able to process 
all this information, append metadata, and solve all the problem of how do I collect my data? How do I make sure that the data has the right context of metadata, and I'm able to deliver this data to a central place like a cloud provider or any kind of storage. That's great, and I love, I love the fact that it's written in C, which kind of gives the, you know, I'll say it, more performance on the code, less overhead, get deeper, closer, um, and people know, know C, and it's, it's high performance. Uh, quick, quick stats though, how old is the project uh, FluentBit? What version are you on? Uh, FluentBit, it's, I'm not sure if it's turning six or seven this year, but likely six. So it's yeah. been around for a while. What likely version? Six. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we just released this this week 1.7.3, right? We have done more than 100 releases. Actually, the release cycle of Fluent Bits is pretty fast. Sometimes we have releases every two, three weeks. So the iteration in the, in the cloud native ecosystem is quite fast. People want more future, more fixes, and they don't want to wait for a couple of months for the next release. They want to have the, the container image right away to test it out and, and actually sense a way as a project, we work with most cloud providers like AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, the, the demand for these fixes and improvements are in a weekly basis. You guys got a lot of props I was checking around on the internet. You guys are getting strong um, reviews on logging for Kubernetes. With the, the couple of releases ago, you had higher performance improvements for you know, Google, AWS, LogDNA, Postgres, SQL, and other, other environments. Um, but the question that I'm getting and I'm hearing from folks is, you know, I, I have end-to-end -end workflows and they've been steady, they've been strong, but as more data comes in and more services are connecting to it from network protocols to other cloud services, the, um, the complexity of what was once a straight, straightforward workflow end-to-end -end is impacted by this new data. How do you guys address that? How would you speak to that use case? Well, for, for us data, we, we have taken approach that data for us is agnostic on the way that it comes from, what that it comes from and the, the format that it comes from. So for example, if you talk about the common uses case that we have now, it's like data comes from different formats. Every single developer uses their own login format comes from different channels, TCP, file system, or another services. So it is very, it's very different how do we get this data? And that is a big challenge, right? How do you take data from different sources, different format, and you try to unify this internally? And then if you're going to talk, for example, to Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch uses JSON. If you're going to talk to Kafka, they have their own binary protocol. So we are kind of the backbone that takes all the data transfers with data and try to adapt um, to the destination expected payload. From a technical perspective, yeah, it's, it's really challenging. Uh, it's really challenging also that nowadays, so two years ago, people was fighting processing, I don't know, 5,000 uh, 5, messages per second. But nowadays they want 10, 20, 40,000. So from an architecture perspective, yeah, there, there are many challenges and and, and I think that the, the teamwork from the maintainers and with companies has, has provided a lot of value, a lot of value. And I think that the, the biggest proof here is that the adoption, Yeah. right? Adoption and bigger adoption, you have more bugs reported, more enhancement requests. All right, so, so if I get this right, you got different sources of data collection issues, if you will, on the front end. And then you got some secret sauce with um, BitFluent, I mean, um, um, inside the Kubernetes clusters, um, and then you deliver it to multiple services and databases and cloud services. Is that, is that right? Is that the key, the key value? Is that the is that the key value proposition? Did I get that right with FluentBit? Yeah, I would say most than a technical implementation. What, what the, of the value of the technical implementation? I would say that is two words: being the vendor neutral, right? So when you come, when you go to the market and you go to the talk to bank institution, hospitals, or any big company, right? Most of them are facing this concept of vendor lock-in, right? Yeah. They use a vendor database, but you have to get married to their tooling, right? And uh, I'm not going to mention any any vendor name, right? You can name but it. actually Go it's ahead. pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for, for example, the business model of this company that start with S and ends with Splunk, right? For example, is you pay as much money, so you pay as much money compared to the data that you ingested. But the default tools 
in just the whole data. But in reality, if you go to the enterprise, they say, yeah, I'm ingesting all my data into Splunk or on X provider, right? But from the 100% that I'm ingesting, which I'm paying for, I'm just using this service to query at least 20% of that data. So why I'm ingesting this 80% extra? I don't need it, right? That's why I want to say, and this is a real use case. They use Splunk, which is really good for queries, analyze the data. But they said, yeah, 80% of my data is just archive data. I will need it maybe in a couple of months. So just I want to send it to Amazon S3 or any kind of other um, archive service. So users, the value that says is that I want to have a vendor neutral pipeline, which me as a user, I want to decide where, where to send the data, when to send it, and also I can control my bills. Right? And I think that is the biggest value. So you can go to the market, you will find uh, maybe other tools for logging or tools for metrics, because there, there's a ton of them. But I, I think that none of them can say we are vendor neutral. Not all of them can offer this flexibility to the user, right? So from a technical angle, it's performance, but from an end user, it's vendor neutrality. Okay, so I have to ask you then here in the CNCF projects that are going on and the community around, um, um, fluent bit, you have to have those kinds of enhancements, integrations, for instance, for not only performance improvement, but extensibility. So enterprises, they want everything, right? <laughs> you know, they make things very complicated. Yeah. They have very complicated infrastructure. So if they want some policy or they want to have data ingestion policies or take advantage of no vendor lock-in, how is the community responding? How do, what's your vision for helping companies? Now you got your new venture, and you got the open source project. How does this evolve? How do you see this evolving, Eduardo? Because you know there is a need for use cases that don't need all the data, but you need all the data to get some of the data, right? So it's a it's you have a new <laughs> new paradigm yeah. of coding, and you want it to be dynamic and relevant. What's the how do you see this evolving? Yeah, actually, I'm going to give you some spoilers, right? Okay. So <laughs> some news before we part. Yeah, so um, end users has this a lot. Of, they had a lot of problems. How to collect the data, process the data, and send the data. We just solved that, right? Performance is a continuous improvement, right? Because you have always more data, more formats, that's fine. But one critical thing that people say is, hey, you say, hey, I want to put my business logic in the pipeline. So think about this. If you have Fluent Bed, we are the backbone for data, right? But we also provide capabilities to do in data processing because uh, you can grab the data or you can do custom modifications over the data. When, one thing that we did like a, a year, two years ago, is we added this kind of stream processing capabilities. Kind of a SQL for Kafka, but we have our own SQL engine in Fluent Bed. So when the data is flowing without having any database, any index or anything, we can do data aggregation you can take, you can put some business logic on it and says for all the data that matches this pattern, send it to a different destination. Otherwise send it to Kafka, Splunk uh, or Elastic. So we have, this is what we have now, stream processing capabilities. Now, what is the spoiler and what we're going next right now? There are two major areas. One of them is distributed stream processing right the capabilities to put this intelligence on the edge on the edge i'm referring to for example um, a kubernetes node right or a constrained environment right kubernetes on the edge is something that is going on there are many companies using that approach but they want to put some intelligence and data processing where the data is being generated because there's one problem once you have more data and you want to query that data you have to wait and to centralize all the data in the database or your service. And there's a latency, right? Minutes, yeah. sometimes hours, because data needs to be indexed. But what about if you have a hundred of nodes, but each one is already running from it? Why you don't run the queries there? That is one of the features uh, that we have. And well, now talking from the challenges, from the spoiler perspective, is people say, okay, I love this pipeline. I know that Fluentbed has a plugable architecture, but the language C, uh, it's not my thing, right? I don't want to code in C. Nobody likes C, 
that we are honest about that and there are many buzzwords about security, oh, not just buzzwords, which yeah. is true, right? It's really easy to mess up things in C, yeah. right? Uh, so, and we said, okay, so now our next level is like we are going to provide this year the ability to write your own plugins in WASM, in WebAssembly. So with a WebAssembly interface, you can run your own plugins in Go, Rust, or any kind of WebAssembly support language and translate that implementation to native WASM that Fluentbit will understand. So C as a language won't be, we won't be longer a blocker for you as a developer, as a company that want to put more business logic into the pipeline. So that is one of the, the hot things that are coming up. I really, we already have some POCs, but they're not ready to show. So maybe we can expect something for KubeCon US at the end of this year. Well, great stuff. By the way, from a C standpoint, us old old timers like me used to program in C and not, not a lot of C courses being taught, but if you do know C, it's very valuable. But again, to your point, the developers are, are, are focused on coding the apps, not so much the underlying. So I think that's, that's key. I will like to ask you one final question, Eduardo, before we wrap up. How do you deploy uh, Fluidbit? What's the, is it, is it you putting it inside the cluster? Is there an, is it scripts? What's the, what's the architecture? Real quick, give us a quick overview of the architecture. Okay, Fluidbit is not just for a cluster. You can run it on any machine, Windows, uh, Linux, VM. Yeah, and that doesn't need to be a Kubernetes cluster, right? When we created Fluidbit, Kubernetes was quite new at the same time. Uh, so if you talk about Kubernetes, you deploy it as a daemon set. A daemon set is pretty much a pod that runs on every node, like an agent, right? Uh, and, or you can run it as a service on any kind of machine. Oh, and one thing before we wrap up, I, I, I just missed to mention something from the spoiler part, because it just gets to my, we are having many news these days, is that uh, FluentD used to be mostly for logging, right? And in FluentBit, a specific project, we got many feedback from years ago saying, you know what, I'm using my agent for logging to embed, but I have my agents for metrics. And sometimes this is quite heavy to have multiple agents on your agent. So now Fluent Bed is extending its capabilities to deal with native metrics, right? And the first version will be available about this week on KubeCon, right? Where we'll be able to process host metrics or application metrics and send them to Prometheus uh, with open metrics format in a native way. So we are extending the Fluent ecosystem to be a better citizen with open metrics and in the future also with uh, open telemetry, which is a, a hot thing that is coming up on this month. Everyone loves metrics, it's super important. Having the data is really, really important as day two operations and GitOps, all this stuff is happening. Eduardo, thank you for coming on and sharing the update and congratulations on the new venture. We'll keep following you and looking for the big launch, but Fluent Bit looking good. Congratulations, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the conference. Okay, this is theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon 21, Cloud Native Con 21 virtual. Soon we'll be back in real life at the events, extracting the signal from the noise. Thanks for watching.